Thank you for joining us at the Evolution of Medicine Summit. A warm welcome. We wanted to make a specific thank you to our sponsors that have made this event possible. Energetics, an innovative natural remedy and supplement company, is committed to revitalizing medicine. And Cyrex Labs, a clinical immunology laboratory specializing in functional immunology and autoimmunity. Most of all, thank you for listening. If you'd like to share this with your colleagues and friends on Facebook, if you enjoy the content, and if you have questions, you can ask us on Twitter with the hashtag EvoMed. Finally, if you really want to play your part in accelerating the evolution of medicine, ask your doctor if the Evolution of Medicine Summit might be right for them. Thank you and enjoy. Hello and welcome back to the Evolution of Medicine Summit. This is James Maskell, your host, and uh, this is part of the Pediatric Day as part of the Evolution of Medicine Summit. And what topic could be more evolutionary than the human microbiome? And today to discuss the human microbiome and our understanding of it and its implication for pediatric health and adult health, uh, I have today with me Dr. Robin Chutkan. And Dr. Chutkan is a integrated gastroenterologist based in the DC area and uh, Dr. Chukhan's uh, philosophy is really helping people to live not just longer but better lives and includes nutritional optimization, stress reduction, exercise and other lifestyle factors as an integral part of diagnostic and therapeutic endeavor. You may have seen her on Dr. Oz on the Today Show. Uh, she, her, her book Gut Bliss has been featured in The Atlantic and The Wall Street Journal and um, on a personal note uh, Dr. Chuck Khan is lovely. We spent the weekend together at uh, the Revitalized Conference in June and had a great time. And she has a personal connection to me because her first cousin is one of England's greatest footballers of my generation, John Barnes. So you're the complete package, Dr. Chuck Khan, and we're so glad to have you on the summit today. Thank you for that lovely introduction. So we're going to talk about the human microbiome and uh, it's, uh, it's mainly housed in the gut, and you're a gastroenterologist, so I'm sure that this was something that you were taught in medical school, right? Well, you know, you couldn't be more wrong about that, actually. In fact, I graduated from medical school in 1991, and it's really just in the last few years that we're beginning to realize that the, the germs, quote-unquote, that we've spent so much time trying to get rid of are actually our friends, not our foes, and a really integral part of our to the body ecology, if you will. So the tide has really shifted from thinking of gut bacteria and bacteria in general as something harmful and pathogenic to realizing that bacteria and gut bacteria in particular are really a vital part of maintaining our health. So the, the sort of short answer to that is no, absolutely not. Nobody was talking about the microbiome. In fact, the term didn't even exist when I was in medical school. That's, uh, you know, it's an amazing tr transition in just a, a short period of years. So I know that you have your own personal story. I mean, uh, this, this evolution of medicine summit, the topic of the microbiome couldn't be more evolutionary in nature because we've evolved with these microbes over time. But it took really a personal story, I know, for you to um, really get interested in this. And uh, that's what made me really want to put this in the pediatric part of it, because I feel like what you're talking about here is really the sort of the ultimate upstream medicine and um, we really need to get this right. So if you could share your story, I think it was just so powerful when I heard it at the, the conference in, uh, in June. Absolutely, I'd be happy to. So my microbiome story, if you will, started a little over nine years ago on March 25th, 2005 when I went into labor. I was my first child that had an uneventful pregnancy, all was well, except I had the flu that year. There was a shortage of flu vaccines and I hadn't had a vaccine and I developed the flu. So when I went into labor, I ended up having quite a high fever. I had about 16 hours of labor and eventually was told I needed a C-section for a variety of reasons, uh, failure to progress. I had received some labor-inducing drugs, and I'm sure that that didn't help. But nonetheless, I had a C-section, which was also uneventful. When my baby was born, the decided that she should go to the neonatal ICU, the NICU, just as a precautionary measure. And they did a, what's called a sepsis workup on her, just checking, make sure there was no infection because of my fever, fever. Now, she was perfectly fine and healthy, but again, sort of just in case. They also decided to give her two very strong intravenous antibiotics just in case because of my fever and the flu. 
And at the time, I thought it was great that they were being so proactive and, you know, sort of giving her antibiotics in case she got sick. Because at the time, I still thought that antibiotics were great. Antibiotics sort of uh, cured you from infection. So I actually want to talk about the C-section first before we even get to the wisdom of antibiotics in a newborn who's actually not sick. The rate of C-sections in the U.S. is now about a third of all births, about one in three. And while I assume that many of those are medically necessary for a variety of reasons, a large number are clearly based on not-so-sound medical practices, like convenience and profit, and also the widespread use of labor-inducing drugs. C-sections bypass this really critical early step in the maturation of the microbiome, and that is colonization with the mother's vaginal bacteria. It's hard to believe that that simple act of passing through the birth canal has such profound implications for later life. I mean, we have clear evidence that shows that C-section babies have higher rates of asthma and allergies and autoimmune disease, things like Crohn's disease, compared to babies born vaginally. So swallowing a mouthful of your mother's microbes as you pass through the birth canal and have a vaginal entry into the world, really, really vitally important. When we look at the microbiome, of babies born via C-section, we find that they're colonized with hospital-associated bacteria like staph versus the, the vaginally born babies who tend to be colonized with lactobacillus and other more beneficial species. So again, this difference in terms of how you enter the world really has profound implications later on. And so not only did my daughter miss out on her mouthful of my vaginal microbiome, as she uh, exited, but also she got these very too strong antibiotics right at birth. I think in large part because of the antibiotics I got and the flu and the fact that I went back to work four weeks after a C-section, my breast milk dried up shortly after at about five weeks. And so this is another thing she missed out on. She ended up having to get formula and had some problems with regular formula, had soy formula, which at the time, again, I thought, oh, no big deal. But looking back on it now, we know that soy formula has the equivalent of about five birth control pills and a day's worth of soy formula in infants. And so, you know, n- nobody really knows what the, um, the long-term consequences of this are and whether this is a good idea. I mean, five birth control pills in a newborn doesn't sound like such a good idea in retrospect. So one of the really fascinating things about breast milk is that it has something in it. Um, in fact, the third most predominant ingredient in breast milk is something called human milk oligosaccharides, HMOs as we call them. So the fascinating thing about HMOs is that even though they're the third most plentiful ingredient in breast milk, babies can't digest them. So why are they, they, why are they there? It turns out HMOs are there to feed the infant's bacteria, Bifidobacteria infantis, which is a predominant bacteria in breastfed infants. So the mother's milk is basically providing a growth medium for the Bifidobacteria infantis and is there to nourish the baby's microbiome. It's really fascinating how that works. The baby's microbiome actually starts to develop in the third trimester. So it, you know, the big event, again, is birth and hopefully passage through the birth canal with a vaginal birth. But really in the third trimester is when it starts to develop. And so, of course, it's greatly influenced by the mother's diet, particularly late in pregnancy. So my daughter missed out. I did eat well during my pregnancy, but she missed out on the vaginal birth, she got the strong IV antibiotics, and then she was drinking soy formula, aka birth control pills, instead of um, my breast milk. And so she, her bifidobacteria infantis was missing out on these very important human milk oligosaccharides. And then what happened next is probably not that surprising to people who are familiar with the microbiome. She started developing infections. At about six months, she had her first episode of fever, sore throat, and uh, was diagnosed with pharyngitis, and she got her first of what would be many, many, many courses of antibiotics. It seems as though every time we were on our way to the airport for a trip, she would have a high fever and inconsolable crying, and we'd end up at the pediatrician's. So over the course of about two and a half years, she ended up with about 15 courses of antibiotics. She also ended up being hospitalized for rotavirus, which ended up as sort of a prolonged hospitalization, much sicker than the typical rotavirus infection. She had prolonged antibiotics for non-draining fluid in her air. 
And then, James, something happened that really made me rethink what I was doing, and that was a trip to the doctor before we were about to go on a vacation. She had a cold and a prolonged cough, as we sort of all did that winter, and my husband insisted on taking her. She came back from the doctor with a nebulizer machine, with stickers, of course, and four prescriptions, an antibiotic, a steroid, an antihistamine, and a bronchodilator. And I thought, this is just crazy. She had been, she'd had 50 visits to the doctor when I counted up all the slips. And again, 15 courses of antibiotics, and was, I was now being told she had asthma. And she was not yet in kindergarten. So that's when I decided that, you know, maybe it was time to take a different approach. And I, I certainly realized that as a physician, I was in a pretty good place to decide we're not going to the doctor quite as frequently. But that's essentially what we decided to do. So we stopped going. And she continued to have fevers and so on, likely viral infections. And we would just sort of tough it out. And she eventually started to get better. I mean, the, the fascinating thing here, again, is that it seems the fewer the antibiotics and the fewer the trips to the doctor for the antibiotics, the healthier she got. And what I would do is if she had a really high fever and complained of a bad sore throat, I'd take her to get swabbed for strep. But, of course, most of these turned out to be viral illnesses. And eventually her resilience improved as her microbiome, which had been so depleted from the onslaught of antibiotics at birth, as that improved, she got healthier. So she's a healthy nine-year-old, and we try and stuff as much kale as possible into her, <laughs> um, but, but all is well. But the other really interesting thing that we noticed, and we noticed it after the rotavirus infection when she was about two, is that prior to that, she'd been a pretty healthy eater. We're, we're pretty healthy eaters. We eat some animal products, but we're mostly plant-based. So she was eating you know, lentil dal burgers and our usual stuff. She came out of the hospital a week later with a serious sugar craving, and I did not understand it. I thought, what have they given my child in the hospital? But I realized it was this gradual shift in her bacterial flora and fauna and probably towards more yeast species and, and other undesirables that really created these cravings. And this is something I observe very frequently in my patients with what we call dysbiosis, bacterial imbalance is that they tend to be what we call picky eaters. They really crave this sort of sugary, starchy stuff. And sometimes it's hard to figure out which comes first. Is it a lot of antibiotics that change the gut flora, that change the microbiome, if you will? And then basically your gut bacteria are telling you what to eat and they're sending you off in search of the mac and cheese and the ice cream. Or is it the bad diet that essentially begets the wrong bugs and then the cravings continue? So it's sometimes hard to figure out, but... I've definitely observed that many of my patients with dysbiosis who have a history, like my daughter did, of frequent antibiotics, it really changes their palate. And it's a fascinating way to think about food and palate is that it might not be you consciously making the decision so much as your microbial species. And if we, if we remember the fact that our microbial cells outnumber human cells 10 to 1, making us far more microbe than we are human. Um, so if you, if you think about it in that context, it becomes easy to see how this living, breathing ecosystem within us, known as our microbiome, can actually be, be sort of making some of these decisions for us, if you will, based on which bacterial species are present. So I found that a fascinating sort of, you know, fallout yeah. of all of this. And we, you know, we continue to really push, as I'm sure most parents do, the importance of the green leafy vegetables and the other things to really try and grow the right kind of bacteria. Absolutely. Well, it's, a, it's an amazing story. And I think, you know, a lot of physicians that come into integrative medicine certainly do it for their own reasons, their own health and their own children's health that gets changed and the lessons they learn. But what would you say have been the major lessons that you have taken from uh, your daughter's health into your now gastro? practice where, you know, because I, I know that the antibiotics are, are, a, are a serious tool of the gastroenterologist, right? James, you know, I, I think it's sort of right, you know, I like to sum things up in a few words and less is more, clearly, because a decade ago, the, ma the mischief we were seeing in the GI tract was primarily caused by non anti-inflammatory drugs. So we had people coming in with, you know, ulcers and bowel perforations and diarrhea and problems from taking too many non anti-inflammatory drugs. And we still see that. 
but it is literally an epidemic. I mean, I turned to my assistant in my office just two days ago and said to her, Betty, what is going on? I mean, the number of people who I see, otherwise healthy people, who are having significant GI distress from bloating to serious abdominal distension to change in their bowel habits to more serious things like Crohn's disease that we can trace back to overuse or inappropriate use of antibiotics is just amazing. It is alarming. I mean, I feel like, you know, definitely more than half my practice at this point is some sort of permutation of that, whether it's dysbiosis or a leaky gut that's been caused by this, a lot of the food intolerances. I saw somebody in the office yesterday who had had a, a, just a tremendous amount of antibiotics. I mean, she estimated she was 21 and she estimated that she'd been on at least five courses of antibiotics over the last 16 years. So, I mean, just a a ridiculous amount of antibiotics. And she had all of these crazy food intolerances that just sort of made no sense. And it was a classic leaky gut situation where uh, she was reacting. You know, there was damage to the digestive membrane and clearly things were passing through that shouldn't be. And she was reacting to them. And, you know, that is a classic story for somebody who's been on multiple antibiotics, The, the gut microbes are a key part of maintaining the integrity of the digestive membrane. And when they are depleted, you know, we not only see the the ratio of good to bad shifting, but the bacterial diversity in general decreases. And this really allows things like, you know, leaky gut and, and all the associated food allergies and intolerances to develop. So, you know, a lot of these patients who a decade ago, we thought, quite frankly, were just crazy, right? Like, what do you mean you eat something and, you know, five minutes later you get a rash or you, you know, have terrible headache or something's going on. And, you know, we thought, we honestly thought a lot of these patients were just sort of neurotic and a little bit crazy. And now I realize, I mean, I think back to patients I saw a decade ago and I realize that, you know, they were right. There was something really weird going on. And, you know, a lot of it is the food also that, you know, we could have a whole conversation about how we're all being slowly poisoned, right? Yeah. So we don't know what the long-term ramifications of things like, you know, genetic modification and so on and all the stuff in our, all the chemicals and things in our food and also what the effect of those things are on gut bacteria. But gut bacteria are, are very, very delicate, particularly the good gut bacteria. And so, you know, these chemicals in our food are a whole other issue. The other startling fact is that 80% of all the antibiotics sold in the U.S. are sold for use in the commercial animal industry. So even if you're not being prescribed an antibiotic, chances are you're ingesting a fair amount of them in your food. And so the implications for antibiotic resistance through what we're eating is really, you know, quite quite frightening when you think about it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we're at a point now, I, I saw the deputy director of the CDC says we're moving towards the end of, an, of the era of antibiotics. For those people at home who sort of don't maybe understand that or can't get their head around that, what is the story with that and how concerned should we be? So there is no question that Alexander Fleming's discovery of penicillin in 1928 is still one of the greatest contributions to modern medicine. It could have prevented events like the Great Plague, which wiped out a quarter of the population of Europe in the 1700s. But we have entered a different era. We absolutely have. We're in this era of overdiagnosis and overtreatment and what people have called Farmageddon where the pendulum has swung from 60, 70 years ago where antibiotics were sort of this life-saving treatment to now, you know, we use an antibiotic for every sniffle. In fact, you don't even have to come into the doctor. So many offices just dispense antibiotics over the phone. In fact, it's often not even a doctor. It's a physician's assistant or sometimes just an administrative assistant with no medical training. Someone calls up, I have a cold, I have a sinus infection, I don't feel well. Oh, we'll call a ZPAC in for you. I mean, that has become so routine and you know there are a lot of reasons why and I I certainly don't blame the medical establishment completely I mean people there's a lot of pressure in our society to not be sick you know time is money I can't afford to not be at work I can't afford to be sick so often there's incredible pressure on the part of the patient to sort of you know well you've got to do something and what we really need to we really need to sort of um, encourage people that it's okay to be sick. You know, you can tough it out and make a little 
chicken soup and maybe a green juice and lie in bed and and that works really well get some rest i mean to some extent the last thing you want to do when you're sick is to go to work and possibly infect other people and not get rest but but that's the way our society is moving that's the direction we're moving in with this idea that nobody can be sick and so there that really that really encourages an over tendency to prescribing rather than just sort of watchful waiting. We also, the way we think about infection, I think we've got that quite wrong. I mean, we, we think about infection as you have this pathogen and we have to hunt it down and kill it. We're, we're really, I think, a more accurate way to think about this is populations of bacteria. So if you think of this balance that I will sort of oversimplify by saying 80% good, 20% bad. I mean, it, it's not an accurate number, but let's just for the purposes of oh, this I think discussion. That is, isn't the number from the Human Microbiome Project that is it, 99 yes, it, and 1? <laughs> it, it might be. You know, in the Human Microbiome Project, they're working very hard at NIH to figure out what the normal microbiome is, but I, I'm not sure that, uh, that we know what that is yet. But let's say a much higher ratio of good to bad. So infection, we're realizing now, isn't so much a presence of, you know, one bad character. It is more an imbalance where we don't have enough good bacteria to sort of drown out bad, the bad folks. So this idea then that, oh, you have a bad bacteria and we're going to give you an antibiotic to get rid of it, what that typically does is it kills off a lot more of your good bacteria. So you get into this vicious cycle and I see this so frequently in patients with sinus infections where they say, oh, I have terrible sinus problems, and they're on antibiotics all through the winter and all through the spring, and they just get sicker and sicker and sicker, more and more resistant. And if they would modify their diet and get off the antibiotics and sort of tough out a couple infections without the antibiotics, they can typically break that cycle. So we should really be thinking in terms of shifting populations rather than how can we kill that bad bacteria. It should be how can we enhance and increase our population of good bacteria so that we don't get sick. Yeah. And I think there's no better example of that than what we're seeing with Clostridium difficile. So you've, you've heard about C. diff, as we affectionately call it. Clostridium difficile is a bacteria that most of us have colonized with at birth in very low amounts. It's, it causes antibiotic-associated problems. It can cause an antibiotic-associated uh, pseudomembranous colitis that causes severe diarrhea, abdominal pain. It can lead to death in uh, significant, I think there are about 15,000 deaths a year in the U.S. from Clostridium difficile. And so what happens is when you take an antibiotic, and there's some that are much more strongly associated, and you kill off a lot of the good bacteria, you allow C. difficile to proliferate. C. difficile that might have been present in undetectable amounts now proliferates and really becomes an overwhelming infection in the colon. And we've used antibiotics to treat C. difficile, which might seem a little counterintuitive, right? I mean, something that's caused by antibiotics, using antibiotics to treat it. And we've had a lot of problems in our in our society with antibiotic resistance C. diff, not surprisingly. So a couple years ago, people started using fecal transplants, what are called fecal microbiota transplants, FMT, to treat C. diff. And lo and behold, not only did it work, it worked really well. It worked far better than the typical antibiotics, vancomycin and metronidazole, that we use to treat C. diff. It worked so well that the CDC actually declared that FMT should be the standard of treatment for refractory C. diff. So just to, just to catch everyone up who's on the line who's, who's not heard this before, what you're actually saying is that by introducing feces into the gut and into that through a transplant, you're able to cure um, a, an infection, which basically seems like exactly the opposite of what, you know, of what we've been thinking this way along. Given, you know, given that, what are sort of the, the implications for just the paradigm that we're living in? It seems like medicine is in, in real need of some evolution. Yes. So, you know, it does turn everything sort of backwards, doesn't it, James? I mean, germs are good. Stool is good. You know, we thought of stool as being bad and dirty. It turns out that our stool is full of really important bacteria. I mean, our stool is full of waste products, too. So I'm certainly not recommending that, you know, people start start transferring stool around. But... 
you know, what we realize is that this is potentially sort of a super probiotic. You know, when we take a probiotic, what we're taking is usually a few strains of beneficial bacteria, often bifidobacteria, lactobacillus, maybe some acidophilus, but there are probably hundreds, maybe even thousands more bacteria that are present in our gut that we haven't yet identified or we're not able to grow in culture outside of the body. And so giving the stool back that potentially contains way more microbes than just what's, you know, in a little probiotic capsule or powder is, is really the approach here. And so again, you know, I said how my daughter's story affected me was realizing that less is more judicious use of medications. Well, dirt is good is the other thing. You know, this, this idea that, you know, everything should be super clean. We've really kind of super sanitized ourselves with all these antibiotics and scheduled C-sections and hand sanitizer everywhere. If we look at a map of the world, one of the really striking things is that we see high levels of autoimmune diseases like Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus in the developed world, in Western Europe and North America, and really low levels in the developing world, in sub-Saharan Africa and parts of Asia. And as countries get more industrialized, and we've seen this in India and the Middle East, the rates of these diseases start to skyrocket. So one of the, uh, we, we trained a GI fellow from Saudi Arabia at Georgetown who finished up about 13 years ago. And at the time, he was very interested in Crohn's. He said, you know, we don't see Crohn's in Saudi Arabia. And I saw him a couple years ago, and he said, we, he's back in Saudi Arabia. He said, we have an entire clinic at my hospital devoted to Crohn's and ulcerative colitis now wow. in the space of about 12 years. So we clearly see this. It's called a hygiene hypothesis. And the idea is that in less developed countries where the level of sanitation may not be as good, where children are exposed to a lot of uh, infection and maybe parasites and so on in the water and in the food, they actually, it's good for the immune system. The immune system needs germs in order to to grow and to be healthy. And people in developing countries are exposed to lots of them, hence much less of these autoimmune diseases later on. In the West, we are super clean and we're exposed to a lot fewer germs and our immune system seem to not be able to develop as well in the absence of exposure. So again, uh, dirt is not a bad thing. And of course, yeah. when I say dirt, I'm speaking euphemistically. No, I, I get, I get that completely. So let's go back and, and talk about an optimal strategy. You know, what are the what what would the optimal development of a microbiome look like from birth to health uh, to sort of adulthood? And what sort of benefits uh, would we you know expect for our own digestive health and also other areas of health with that you know much more improved deep a stronger microbiome? So I'm glad you asked that question, James, because the longer I practice medicine, the more fervently I believe that good health is not an accident and that it's not our genes either. Uh, you know, we think of, of health and disease as being conferred by our genes, but I think more and more the evidence grows that our genetic factors play a much smaller role than previously anticipated. And so much of this stuff is environmental based on diet and lifestyle. So, you know, how to sort of develop the ideal microbiome is, and I'm going to tell you my ideas on that in a second, is essential because the list of conditions grows and grows and grows in terms of conditions that are associated with problems in the microbiome. So sort of the classic autoimmune things, like Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis and lupus and rheumatoid arthritis, diabetes, coronary artery disease, celiac disease, neurological disorders. There's a lot of evidence now for bipolar disorder being related to gut bacteria, perhaps some forms of autism, allergy and asthma, obesity. So every day there's a new condition. There was just a study that came out last week showing that alterations in gut bacteria, frequent antibiotic use was associated with an 8 to 10% increased risk of colon cancer. So malignancy is another big group there. So, you know, Hippocrates said it thousands of years ago, all disease begins in the gut, and it's really looking as though he was right. So I would start really with, you have to go back even before your own birth to your mother and the maternal diet. So I would say that avoidance of antibiotics in pregnancy is ideal. 
and that the mother should eat a, an ideal diet to grow a healthy gut garden, which would be lots of leafy greens, lots of vegetables containing inulin, like artichoke and asparagus, uh, fruits, nuts, seeds, maybe a little bit of animal protein if that is their desire. But basically a diet that's very low in fat and starch and sugar, the opposite of the standard American diet, the sort of Western diet. And, um, and that should be the basis for the diet of the mother because, again, the baby, the fetus, is going to start acquiring his or her microbiome in the third trimester. And that's really a direct result of the microbial milieu of the mother. Yeah. And then, of course, a vaginal birth is, is a huge advantage to that, breastfeeding. I think at least through six months, if possible, in order to confer immunity and in order for the baby, uh, the baby's bacteria to really benefit from those HMOs that we talked about. When you say confer immunity, can you can you just share what you mean there? Because most people, I think, think that immunity is just a function of the antibodies that are generated from vaccination. But it sounds like there are other ways to develop immunity through um, interactions with our microbes. Absolutely. So it turns out that a large part of our immunity has to do with our gut bacteria. And so, again, you know, we talked about the breastfeeding and how important that is in terms of the breast milk feeding the baby's gut bacteria. So that's a great example of transference of immunity there through breast milk, not just through passive transfer of antibodies, but actually through feeding the gut bacteria and having the baby develop a healthy microbiome. And similarly, the breast milk is going to reflect what the mother's eating. So that's an important time, you know, while the mother's nursing to still be very cognizant of what are the sorts of foods that are going to promote a healthy microbiome. And then, of course, once the baby starts to graduate to table food, um, very, very important what they're eating. There is a fantastic study that was done by Paolo Leonetti, uh, who's a Florentine researcher, and he took a group of kids in Florence, Italy, and a similar group in Burkina Faso and looked at the gut bacteria. Now, at birth, breastfed infants in both populations were very, very similar. There were very few differences. But as soon as a baby started to graduate to the indigenous diet, the gut bacteria diverged dramatically. So the kids in Florence eating a typical Western diet, high in fat and sugar, they were, you know, gelato and pizza and pasta and lots of good stuff. They had gut bacteria that were associated with allergy and asthma and obesity. And the group in Burkina Faso who were eating a typical plant-based diet that was grown locally, enlivened by the occasional termite, they had gut bacteria associated with leanness and high levels of short-chain fatty acids, which seemed to be a crucial byproduct in terms of keeping the gut lining healthy. So they saw these very significant differences very early on as soon as they started eating table food. So that's the other thing that we have to keep in mind is, you know, what our kids are eating really from a young age. And this isn't, this is nothing to do with weight. This is everything to do with health. Because what I see is I see skinny kids eating really bad food and the parents sort of turning a blind eye and saying, well, my kid is just a string bean, so it really doesn't matter that they're having you know, mac and cheese and ice cream every day. Because this is much more about whether your child is overweight or obese. This is really predicting what's to come in terms of the likelihood that they could develop things like Crohn's disease and maybe even cancer down the road. So very important to pay attention to the diet and I, I really what well, the advice I give my parents is uh, my, the parents of uh, children <laughs> not my own parents yeah. a little late for that um, is that you really have to pay attention to what the kids are missing so you know a bowl of ice cream isn't going to kill you but a lack of green vegetables just might so focus on what your child is missing more than the fact that they're you know eating one more sweet than they should and um, really make sure you get those green vegetables in, that they're getting in lots of fresh fruit. Vitally important. You, you can't get the same thing from giving them, you know, fruit juice or a fruit roll-up or, you know, a vegetable-flavored concoction. You really need them to get those fibrous vegetables in. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, so let's say 
people are listening to this and they know that their child has not had, uh, you know, the, the ideal uh, interaction with antibiotics, i.e. there's been a lot of antibiotics. And, and that's probably most people, frankly, because I think I've read statistics of, you know, the, the average numbers and it's extremely high. I think someone said there was 40 courses of antibiotics by the age of 30. And, you know, going back, like people are, are you know, they're, as you said, they're just being given out there. So is there some reason for optimism that, that this is not like um, this is not the end of the road that things can recover? There's incredible cause for optimism. The microbiome that you're born with is not the one that you have today or even next week or maybe even tomorrow. So it changes and it changes quickly. There's a fascinating study from Harvard researchers last year where they took nine volunteers and they put them on a typical sort of low-carb Atkins type regimen with ribs and brisket and salami and pork rinds and they looked at the microbiome before, during and after. Then they rested the same group and they put them on a plant-based diet with jasmine rice and lentils and tomato and squash and fruit instead of pork rinds for a snack. And what they found was that not only did the microbiome change dramatically, it changed quickly. Within about 30 hours, the bacterial species started to change. Not surprisingly, on this sort of high meat and cheese diet, they saw more bilophilia, more bile-loving bacteria that help to break down fat but are also associated with inflammation. And the genes that were turned on also started to change too. So this is great cause for optimism. I mean, not only can we change our gut bacteria, we can change it quickly. We can change it by tomorrow. And I, you know, I read this study and I commented to my husband that, you know, on the days when I have a green smoothie in the morning with berries and kale and spinach, and then I have a salad for lunch, and then I have rice and dal and more greens for dinner. Not only do tremendous things happen in the bathroom the next morning, but I said, you know, I feel good, like my cells feel different. And while I'm sure that a lot of that is in my head, maybe some of that is in my gut. Maybe my gut bacteria are actually starting to shift by the end of the day. I mean, it's just, it's just fantastic evidence that well, first of all, we really are what we eat and we are what our gut bacteria eat. And, um, you know, I think it's such a message of hope for people like me, quite frankly, whose daughter, you know, we sort of did all these antibiotics thinking we were doing the right thing and that it really can change. It can change quickly. It's not like thinking about genes where, gosh, you know, I'm born with these genes and I'm stuck with them. A lot of disease seems to be mediated through changes in the microbiome, which changes very quickly. I mean, of course, it's taken us, from an evolutionary point of view, it's taken us a long, long time, millennia, to get to where we are with our gut bacteria, but they can change very quickly. And, and we don't want to, uh, we have to be careful how we don't destroy this evolutionary advantage we've been given in terms of, you know, the beneficial things that our, our life, our millennia back in the cave have given us, that we don't want to scrub that all away with hand sanitizer and antibiotics. Yeah, so it's, it's optimistic. What I hear you saying is optimistic in how quickly the gut microbiome can shift. And then the implications for that are huge because it seems like you said earlier that the gut microbiome is being linked to all types of other areas. And you mentioned psychiatry, um, neurology. Actually, on the doctor conference of part of the summit this weekend, Dr. David Perlmutter will actually be announcing um, the beginning of his first journal that he's editing on the link between the gut and the brain. There's so much evidence now it needs its own journal and so um you know if you're listening to this and your doctor doesn't know that or doesn't believe in it um get him to listen this weekend ask your doctor if uh the evolution of medicine summit weekend might be right for him um and you know get him on because this is a, a big area but you also mentioned you know obviously gut dysfunction and, and other organs within internal medicine but you also mentioned genes could you just take people through because i, I think that's a, a difficult uh concept to to understand the first time that, that changes in the microbiome could actually change your gene expression? Absolutely. So genes can actually shift. They can transfer between bacteria and the microbiome and bacteria in the environment. And a great example of that is horizontal gene transfer from farm animals. So I talked about the fact that there are a lot of antibiotics used in the commercial animal industry. And when, when we eat something, so for example, you know, we eat a piece of meat, genes in, in that product can actually transfer to genes in our microbiome and become essentially a part of our DNA because we include our microbial DNA in terms of, of how we define ourselves. 
And there is a high rate of gene transfer between bacteria and the microbiome and the environment. And we just don't know what the implications are. I mean, if there is a gene that we're ingesting that produces a toxin and then it transfers to a gene in our microbiome, we can then sort of turn our gut into a toxin-producing little chemical factory uh, right there. So this is, you know, this is, this is sort of science fiction type stuff. And the really fascinating thing is that I remember, you know, 15 years ago, patients coming in and saying, I think I have inflammatory bowel disease because of all the non-steroidals I took. And we were sort of like, oh, nonsense. Then it turns out, hmm, not so much. And then we had patients coming in and saying, I think I have inflammatory bowel disease because of all the antibiotics I got. And we thought, gosh, that's far-fetched. It was just a study from Mount Sinai Hospital in New York last year that showed that sure enough, use of, frequent use of antibiotics of Cipro and metronidazole, non-penicillin antibiotics, was strongly associated with new onset of Crohn's disease. And the irony here is that these are two antibiotics we frequently use to treat these conditions. And it turns out they have a causative role. And then, you know, we have patients coming in saying, you know, I think I'm being poisoned by the food, maybe the GMO food, the chemicals in food. And we thought, that's far-fetched. Not so much. So one of the observations in all of this for me is that it's really the patients who have opened my eyes to a lot of things. I mean, I feel like I'm learning so much more from, of course, from scientific observation and study, but the patients often are clever about this in the way that we as physicians, having been been sort of taught in a more conventional, traditional evidence-based way, are sometimes slow to adopt. I mean, we're the slow adapters. A lot of the time. So one of the things that I would urge uh, our audience to do, I mean, I, I am still a conventional doctor. I wear a white coat. I have a prescription pad. I try to whip it out as infrequently as possible, but is to really keep an open mind and to listen to your patients when they say things that sound outlandish and far-fetched because a few years later, you'll often find that they're correct. Um, and it is just, I mean, I feel like we are on this journey and we're moving at a thousand miles an hour in terms of what we're finding out. And, and it's throwing all these ideas about where disease comes from and our genes and so on. It's just throwing everything that we thought, turning it upside down and really throwing it into question. And I think it's fantastic. It's magnificent. Yeah. Well, absolutely. And, and part of this summit is really to, you know, to share that because this is a, a medical uh, conference, if you will. But we had to invite the patients because the patients are going to play a huge role in the evolution of medicine. And the evolution of medicine really does uh, look at a different type of relationship between the doctor and patient where the patient is honored for the information that they provide because they're there with themselves all the time and the doctor only has just a, a small window into it and one of the things that I love about functional medicine is really uh, you know part of it really is is focusing on listening to the patient and really having them to you know to give an opportunity to you know to tell their story and I think that's certainly the you know the, the basis for uh, the future of, of patient care and I'm, I'm glad that some practitioners have had to go through a certain journey to be able to see that but uh, it sounds like you know from just the examples that you've given there that um, you know we do have to keep open-minded and physician and patient relationships need to be open-minded so that you know we can really get to the to the to the core of the dysfunction so um, as we're on the on the pediatric day and looking at this here so just to just to keep it really simple as uh, what I hear you saying is that we need to minimize our exposure to antibiotics because it's it's doing some some problems to the gut that are, are long lasting, and we also need to eat right. But maybe you could just talk a little bit uh, more about this uh, the concept of of being um, in a germ rich environment because it, it seems like not only do we use the hand sanitizers and so forth, but we're actually not um, in the kind of you know never before in human history has the outside not been part of the inside. Um, you know if you if you look back, we need to have a more regular interaction with germs. I, I loved what you said at the conference. You said uh, live dirty, eat clean, and do you, I mean, do you have some sort of practical ways that parents who want to live a little bit dirtier could do that in a, in a safe, uh, safe way for their kids and for adults too. Absolutely. If we look at not just populations in Burkina Faso versus Florence and developed world versus developing, but if you look right here at our own neighborhoods in the U.S. and in other more developed societies, one of the phenomena that we observe is that as neighborhoods become sort of unwilded and as the amount of concrete and glass grows, goes up, 
the bacterial diversity decreases and the species that were colonized with on our skin and so on changes and the rates of allergy and asthma, which are huge problems for, for children, really skyrocket. So in the concrete jungle of New York City, in, in certain pockets, we see very, very high rates of allergy and asthma. So one of the really simple things is to get outside, to get out away from the concrete and glass, to get into areas where there's grass, whether it's Central Park in New York or Rock Creek Park in Washington, D.C., and, and let your children get a little bit dirty you know, we certainly, we used to have just dirty Fridays at our house where, you know, if you didn't want to bathe, you didn't have to, even if you'd had soccer practice. And I just feel like I'm much more relaxed. I mean, I do try to get my daughter to wash her hands and wash her feet and certainly floss and brush. But, you know, if she doesn't want to wash her hair and um, she's not that dirty. It's okay. And certainly I don't encourage her to lather up with uh, soaps that have a lot of chemicals in them, you know, just a little bit of judicious washing in the parts that get really dirty is is what we need to be doing because when we we use these you know sodium lauryl sulfates and these chemicals all over our skin we really change the gut bacteria on the surface of, of our bodies too which can often lead to problems down the road whether it's acne or uh exacerbation of eczema and things like that so our skin microbes are very important too and seem to speak to our gut microbes so so let your kids play in the dirt. I mean, you, you know, you still have to be careful. Don't let them play where there's dog poo and they're going to pick up a parasite, but, but let them play in the dirt. Let them dig in the ground. Maybe have them plant some vegetables with you. Having a pet seems to be a very good idea. And, um, you know, animals, we can, we talked about the transfer of microbes from farm animals, but we can have some healthy transfer of microbes from household pets too. Open a window, you know, try to not have this very super clean artificial air environment. If it's not boiling hot or freezing cold, maybe turn off the air conditioner or the heater and just open a window and let some fresh air in. And um, I certainly am, have, have never been particularly obsessive about, you know, something fell on the floor sort of thing. But it turns out, you know, if some food falls on the floor, it might not be a bad idea for your child to pick it up and eat it um, and not, not being so obsessive about washing it. And of course, it's a little bit of a of a tricky thing because we know that there are a lot of foodborne illnesses. There's pathogenic E. coli and so on, and so you do have to be careful about washing fruits and vegetables. But I'm talking about in your home, not in a not in a factory where there's E. coli floating around, but in a safer environment like your home or your backyard. Really, it's so important to have your children go outside and play and get a little bit dirty. Yeah, well, isn't it fair to say though? With, with, with because this is the biggest thing that I think we can talk about here, uh, Doctor, is that there is a meme in society that germs are bad, right? And this is yeah. this is going to take more than just my little conference or my little summit or this conversation to change because this is a huge thing that's changed. And I think one of the things is that people are starting to like um, almost zone out from this information because like fat was bad and now fat is good or now, you know, germs are bad and now germs are good. Like it's, you know, this, this good and bad makes it easy to communicate a message, but I'm not sure if it's particularly, you know, particularly serving us in the long term because, you know, we have to like unwind this whole society built around cleanliness. And just to go back to your last point, if there are foodborne illness, my understanding is that with a, with a strong and robust mucosal immunity and gut and microbiome, we're less likely to have symptoms as a result of those type of bacteria coming into us because it's not like there's only a few of them they come in. I mean, there's trillions of bacteria all around us all the time, right? That's exactly right. And that's such a useful way to think about it. I mean, we've all probably had that experience where, you know, there's someone in the office who just never gets sick, right? So everybody gets the flu, but this one person doesn't. And chances are they're a really good eater. They didn't take a lot of antibiotics. They're really healthy. So, you know, when we think about infection as being less about being you being exposed to that one bad bug that's going to do you in and more about what does your healthy population of bacteria look like, we don't have to be as worried and sort of obsessed obsessed about, you know, catching a, catching a germ, catching a bug. And that, that's a really important way to think about it. 
That's yeah. I, I just it just seems like the unwinding of that meme is going to take a lot because even the word germs, like if you when you say that word, it makes you think of something that's really negative, and um, you know it's so ironic given that we've evolved with these microbes and they play so many different roles in um, in our synergy through immunity and metabolism and digestion. Um, you know they're 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 helping us all the way through. So I've heard you say before, and your talk has been that, that the microbiome is going to be the future of medicine. And certainly through all of these interviews that I've done through uh, for this summit, and just from you know speaking to those doctors who are on the cutting edge of this, they certainly agree that because changes in the microbiome can happen so quickly, and because the implications for the rest of the body and the connections between the gut microbiome and the rest of the body are so um, uh, complex and, 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 and important that this might be the future of medicine is there any any medical discipline or any symptom that that you can think of in a sort of chronic disease that um you know that doesn't isn't touched by the microbiome and, and why do you feel like this is really the future of medicine you know i'm really hard pressed to think about an area certainly it it looms very large for autoimmune disease i was surprised to read some of the data on heart disease that was an area where I thought, well, maybe not so much coronary artery disease. Not, I mean, I'm really, again, hard-pressed to think of an area that it doesn't involve. And psychiatry, I mean, there have been studies on, uh, for not just things like bipolar disorder, but even people having psychotic episodes where they've looked at the gut bacteria and made interventions and been able to affect that. So I, I do think it is, you know, the bacteria seem to be the, the landscape on which our genetic and evolutionary factors play out. And if you think about the gut, when you eat something, it's really not inside your body. It's in this hollow conduit that runs from our mouth to our anus that sort of splits us into two halves. And things that are in the gut lumen are not inside the body. Again, they're in this passageway. So the gut is the portal of entry, not just for nutrients to get in, but for viruses and bacteria and antigens and chemicals and all kinds of things. So the gut membrane is really the portal of entry for these things to get in. And when it is damaged because the gut bacteria aren't present in sufficient quantities or ratios or because it has holes in it from drugs you've taken, um, that's when things can really get into the body and travel through the bloodstream to different aspects, to different areas of the body. So one of the things that's so perplexing about autoimmune disease is, you know, you have Crohn's disease, but you also have alopecia and you also have uh, Hashimoto's thyroiditis and you also have psoriasis. And it's pretty clear that you don't have six different diseases really, right? That there's one main thing that's driving it. And so the microbiome is sort of the missing link for so many of these things. This is the factor that when you consider it, really start, you, you're able to make sense of why somebody has six different autoimmune manifestations going on because there've been problems in the gut and it served as a portal of entry and now all these different organ systems have been activated, if you will. And if you can crack that nut and figure out how to fix that, you should be able to sort of reverse domino effect and fix these multiple autoimmune phenomena, which is just a, you know, an incredibly optimistic way of looking at this again. Yeah, very optimistic. And actually, you, you've tied in some amazing concepts that we're going to have this weekend in the medical conference, part of it for doctors. We're going to look at the evolution of psychiatry that definitely includes microbes. We're going to look at the evolution of autoimmunity and immunology that definitely get into these areas. Uh, I guess one question I have for you is, is when you go to gastrointestinal conferences now and you're meeting other GI doctors, what's the, the mood like? like because you guys are now being sort of seen as the the forefront and the f future of medicine because you take care of the part of the body that's uh, the most important which is sort of ironic because you know you've sort of been getting it wrong for quite a long time as well well finally we have our due and people realize that the <laughs> gut is the most important organ and stool is magnificent and not just a waste product but you know one of the sad things james is still that uh, my specialty of gastroenterology is still a field that's very procedure oriented based on the reimbursement schedule the fact that gastroenterologists get paid very well for doing procedures and not well at all for sitting talking to patients 
these conditions, dysbiosis, alterations in the microbiome, these really require sitting down and rolling our sleeves up and talking to patients at length about their history. You know, how many antibiotics did you take in childhood? Why? When? What other drugs? What about steroids and hormones and, and ibuprofen type things? This is not the sort of thing that is revealed with a quick colonoscopy or endoscopy. And one of the things I've noticed is that a lot of these patients who come in with, with sort of leaky gut and other difficult to diagnose conditions, they get scoped from above and below. They get an endoscopy and we pare down into the stomach and small intestine. They get a colonoscopy and we pair up into the colon and it all looks normal. And they frequently get a pat on the head and get told, well, everything looks fine. Maybe you're just stressed out. So I think as gastroenterologists, we are in a unique position to really understand what's going on in the gut. But I think we have to look beyond the reach of the endoscope. And we have to consider some of these things that we can't see or touch or feel or measure quite as easily. We are fortunate to have resources with um, companies like Ubiome and, of course, the Human Microbiome Project at NIH that are really looking at this. And, and Ubiome creates great opportunities for the citizen scientist to uh, go ahead and send in some swabs and, and get a look at their microbiome. But I think we have to cast a broader net when we look at our patients and what causes their symptoms and disease and look beyond, again, what is visible endoscopically and, and look to horizons that are not completely visible just yet. Yeah, well, that's, that's you know, extremely profound. And, and, and I think there's good reason for op- optimism. And doctor, just before we, we finish here, and I, I really appreciate your time. And I, I feel like, you know, certainly there's going to need to be doctors to train the next generation of physicians that are going to actually be able to think this way and be able to help people through these complex diseases because they're not going away. We certainly haven't reached the um, the peak of these diseases. They, they keep going up and I'm really glad to, that there are doctors like you who understand this and can communicate well about it. So I, I've been asking all of the people that I've had in the summit, all of the doctors and speakers that I've had to give sort of their ideas on, on the evolution of medicine. That's the phrase that, that we've used. We feel like it has so many different uh, connotations and the way that medicine is evolving. When I say the evolution of medicine, what does that what does that make you feel? It makes me think of information sharing, James, of the old paradigm where I'm the doctor and I'm up on a pedestal and I know everything and you're the patient, you're down below and you know nothing. And I'm going to parse out little snippets of information to you as I see fit. Um, it's a very, you know, the, the patient as supplicant. And it has really, the internet, quite frankly, has really leveled things so that not only do the patients often know as much as a physician, they sometimes know more. Now, they may be missing a context in which to interpret information, but um, I really see a model that is much more integrative, not just between um, conventional medicine and naturopathic medicine, uh, but between specialties, between infectious diseases and gastroenterology and immunology and between patients and physicians where, you know, we're all sort of in a huddle trying to figure this out, you know, over a computer or, or a stool specimen, quite frankly. So that, that's how I see medicine evolving to much more of a conversation, a dialogue as opposed to a monologue that a physician is having with their patient. Yeah, that's that's a that's a great insight. And how do you how do you feel about the future of interdisciplinary communication? Because yes, the GI doctors are responsible for maybe the most important organ. You can see that now. But it seems as like this this paradigm of just parceling up the body into different parts and having specialists that that might have to go in the evolution of medicine too, right? Absolutely. I think it really has to go clearly where one integrated system. And, you know, the other thing is that the microbiome is very uh, organ specific. It's, it's different. So all the more reason for us to talk. I mean, I need to talk to Dr. Perlmutter about what's going on in the brain from a microbiome point of view uh, and how it relates to what is happening in the gut for his patients. I mean, it's, it's very, um, it's not just one unique microbiome. It's different in different parts of the body and um, the changes in the gut might affect the changes in the brain and vice versa. So it's very important for that communication to happen. Absolutely. Well, it's been amazing to have you as a guest here. And I think some of the takeaways that you've offered for people who are listening, this has been part of the pediatric day. And I think the most important reason why it is part of the pediatric day is, is just for that last reason you shared is that, you know, if we can start the next 
generation of children. I have a young daughter and, you know, my intention is certainly to, you know, have her be informed about her health and be empowered in the health process, but also to give her the best start uh, to build a resilient microbiome and to, you know, to be um, healthy and to be able to avoid disease. But in the same way that you're saying with the internet, I think that what we see is that obesity is contagious because people, uh, you know, hang out with other people that are the same. And I think that if we can, we have to start somewhere and it seems like we really have to start with, um, you know, start with the next generation, get them healthy, get the communication pathways open, get the patient and the doctors all communicating properly. And then we might have a chance at uh, accelerating this, this evolution of medicine. And I really appreciate, you know, what you've shared today. I, I think that, um, you know, this is the most important topic in medicine. And I think if we can start to get this right, the knock-on effects, the, the sort of causal chain of improvements in the microbiome and understanding it better will, you know, will roll out into all other aspects of, of the body. And I just think that, um, you know, we, we have a pretty solid path by which to, you know, to look at these kind of things now. It's just about taking steps down the path. I couldn't agree more, James. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to talk about this topic that's so, so dear to me. No problem. Well, this has been Dr. Robin Chutkan. You can find out more about her. Where's the best, uh, best way you can read her book, which is Gut Bliss? I, I love that book. Uh, what's, your, what's the best website to find out more about your work, Doctor? It's probably gutbliss.com. Okay. Gutbliss.com is the website. This has been Dr. Robin Chutkan. This is the Pediatric Day of the Evolution of Medicine Summit. I'm your host, James Maskell. It's been a pleasure being with you today. Remember Dr. Chuck Kahn's uh, words of wisdom, live dirty, eat clean. Thanks so much.